Well, hello, everybody. Uh, my name's Andrew. I'm the organizer of this uh, webinar for Conservation Nebraska. Just a few housekeeping things to get out of the way. Uh, if you haven't attended one of these uh, webinars before, all of the attendees are muted and your cameras are turned off for security reasons. So if you're wondering about that, there's your answer. Uh, at the end of the lecture portion, we will open up the floor to questions. And if you would please post those in the Q&A box down at the right-hand uh, side of the bar at the bottom of your screen. That would be wonderful. Uh, not the chat so that they just all end up in one place. Um, okay, that's that. So just a little bit about Conservation Nebraska. We're an organization dedicated to improving Nebraska, Nebraska's environmental quality through education, outreach, and community organization. So what better to, way to do that than through learning about Nebraska's own environmental heritage with native grasses and who better to talk about it than our two speakers, Cheryl Dunn and Mitch Stevenson. Cheryl Dunn is the research manager and herbarium curator in the Department of Agronomy and Horticulture at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. And Mitch Stevenson is a range management specialist based at the UNL Panhandle Research and Extension Center. They'll be covering the history and importance of native grasses in Nebraska and examining the variability in the Sand Hills plant communities from east to west. And then we're going to open up the floor for questions. So without further ado, Cheryl Dunn and Mitch Stevenson. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of the warm up act here, right before before we get to we get to Mitch. So let me go ahead and, and share my screen. And I'll get going here. Need to move everything around. Okay, so, so I'm going to take you through some kind of the history of the of the grasslands and our grasses in particular. And I'm also going to make you um, learn some plant identification tonight as well. So, um, so just kind of stick with me. All right, so the first map I have here, there's a bunch of yellow on here. So what is that? And so in particular, we're going to talk about grasses, right? And when we talk about grasses, that's in the family Poaceae. And they are a critical part of our ecosystems and part of our economy, our health, our well-being, depend on these grasses. And so this yellow part here actually shows our grasslands and how they inhabit all major land masses. And so grasses are um, really exhibit tremendous taxonomic richness. There's over 11,000 species in that Poaceae or that grass family. They range from um, herbaceous plants to more of our tree-like bamboos. They occupy warm and cold deserts and also all the way to, to rainforests. And so grasses um, are Earth's most important crop plant. Um, our rice, is, our, our grasses, the corn, um, our cereal grains, and they also supply us important building material like our bamboo and also our biofuels. I don't know if you've heard about switchgrass. You're gonna learn how to identify switchgrass tonight. Um, that's, a, that's a potential important biofuel. So grass dominated habitats um, and this includes our temperate grasslands, our tropical savannas, and our cropland cover 40% of the Earth's land surface. And in particular, we have the North American continent that we have seen. They have found um, grasses on here for almost 20 million years. But the central grasslands that I'm going to focus in on tonight, obviously, where we live, um, is a relatively recent origin. So while there is evidence in the fossil record that some of the earliest grasses were bamboo species, um, they were found in the Cretaceous uh, period under trees in kind of wetter mountainous areas. Um, but the Great Plains fossil records ultimately indicate that during the um, Pliocene and the Miocene um, era, um, when there was more forest and woodlands, um, ultimately that area or that region and that time period became more arid. And so therefore the trees moved to more of the moister um, valleys and then the grasslands began to, um, began to spread. Now, when it comes to the fossil record, it is really hard to get 
grass species, foss species fossils because they just don't um, withstand the arid environment, so they can't be preserved very well. So what researchers have had to do to kind of piece together the records of grasses is look at our hoofed mammals. They have looked at those ungulates and looked at their teeth um, to determine where exactly grasses fit in. And so if we look in this graph here, and this is based upon horses and their relatives. So kind of they looked at horse evolution to determine our grasses. And we can see down here, it's kind of not the best of um, graphs, but you can see there's woodland savannas and then savannas, so we see more grasses, and then we ultimately get to um, prairie as well. And this box right here kind of shows a potential shift between our cool season grasses, which actively grow in the cooler spring months, versus our warm season grasses, which actively grow in the middle of our summer months. And so um, with the cooler temperatures, um, there were the, the cool seasons dominated, right? And then as it got warmer and drier, then our warm season grasses dominated. So um, grasses have developed specific adaptations for these grazing um, hoofed mammals. And so their growing points are near the soil surface. And we're gonna talk about that more here after a while too. But, um, but, but again, the, the fossil record for grasses is, is somewhat um, incomplete because of, because of the preservation problem. Ultimately though, during the Pleistocene era that we have here, there was a climate change, there was a shift. We ended up having this continental ice. And so those, those grasslands that we knew in the Pliocene and the Miocene got disrupted. So ultimately what happened is we had the Pleistocene um, time period where we had all these ice sheets that you can see here in the different colors. And at the peak of that kind of Wisconsin glaciation, which was about 18,000 years um, before present, most of the central grasslands were dominated by spruce and jack kind of um, uh, pine forest. All right, or they were covered in glacial ice. And then during the Holocene, which happened after our Pleistocene, um, they, there uh, came more grasslands or oak savannas. And so what we saw is these two uh, maps down here is we saw those grassland systems begin to move northward and start replacing those forested regions, especially in the eastern part um, of the easternmost part of what we now consider our grasslands. And this was really because of uh, the hypsothermal um, time period that we really saw a lot of drying and we also saw an increase of fire. So there was fire going on before, before um, you know, we even were around. So um, again, there was a shift in the cool season to warm season kind of grasses and and, and that could not only be because of the warming of the, of, in the hypsothermal area, but also because of the drop in carbon dioxide. And so this is an interesting thing that people are looking at because we are, our climate is warming and we're getting more carbon dioxide. So which, is it the cool season or the warm season? Um, photosynthesis is going to ultimately um, be favored. So that last map that I showed you really kind of shows where the, our central grasslands came here uh, in, in North America. And so now for over 200 years ago, the Great Plains, you know, was a complex mosaic of prairie types. Um, you know, most notably, we had the tall grass prairie or what was called the true prairie um, in the east. You had the mixed grass prairie in the middle. And then in the far west, you have the short grass prairie. And this really, um, uh, precipitation changes is what has facilitated these different heights of grasses and that um, the rain shadow from the Rockies, so those Rocky Mountains preventing some of that moisture from falling, has, has allowed for um, the short grass prairie to be that less than two uh, feet tall. And then as you move further west, then you get to the grasses that are six to eight feet tall in the tall grass prairie. So this is kind of a historical map of, of what things used to be. Things have changed so much now and we need an updated map because we, we have lost so much of the tall grass prairie and a lot of the mixed grass prairie. Um, but 
unfortunately, in the beginning, when, when settlers came out here, and, and as we've, um, even as modern, as we've gotten into more of a modern era, a lot of people have used disparaging terms for this region, such as the American desert, um, treeless, unwatered, forgotten in the flatlands. And, and um, as someone that lives and works in this region, there is so many things to be um, appreciative of um, working in a grasslands. And so, as I said, this is kind of the historical map of our grasslands. Um, the temperate grasslands and, and this portion right here are one of the most endangered biomes um, in the world. So, so what we're gonna do is focus in on obviously Nebraska where we live. And you can see there's so many colors in Nebraska because we have so many different prairie types and I'm gonna walk you through um, each of those prairie types. So Nebraska is, is really interesting in, in what we have um, uh, available when it comes to um, our different prairies. We have the tall grass prairie in the east, we have our mixed grass prairie, and two different types of mixed grass prairie, which we'll talk about, and the sand hills, and then also the short grass prairie. And, and again, each of these grasslands um, really owe their character to some very abundant grasses or the dominant grasses. And those dominant grasses, you know, they um, uh, they control the water supply, they control light, they co control other factors in the environment. And so when you learn just, you know, maybe eight to 10 of those dominant grasses, um, you really become familiar and really become familiar with their life habit, then you can really begin to understand the prairie. And so I'm going to show you um, each of these kind of dominant grasses in each of these um, prairie regions and how easy it can be to start identifying these. Um, and, and yes, there are tons of different grasses, types of grasses out there, but I definitely can have you key on a few of those because I feel like, again, if you start appreciating the prairies and start seeing and identify plants in those prairies, it leads to greater conservation. Okay, so those are the beautiful pictures I'm going to be showing you here. But before I move into the tall grass prairie, I want you to understand where Lincoln is and where the University of Nebraska sits. This is in a photo from 1872 on a very noticeably treeless prairie. So when we first got here, right, we, there were no trees. We became the Arbor State and planted a bunch of trees. And, but this is what it originally looked like. And, um, and now we've got a lot of trees. And so we need to think of like, even though the grasslands were shaped by some level of climate, that climate can still support and support it well woody vegetation. And that's where we can see the loss of our prairies. So the tall grass prairie, I love it. It's beautiful. The wildflowers actually outnumber the grasses by four to one usually. So there's more wildflowers than there are grasses. But you know, the, the most productive plants out there are our grasses. They produce 80% of, of what you're seeing out there. And as you see it, there's as just as much vegetation as there is above ground. There's that much below ground in the form of roots with an extremely extensive root system. So the tall grass prairie, I, I get kind of claustrophobic in like the tall grass prairies that you see in kind of Iowa. This is from Iowa, these couple pictures, but you're pretty much, they're over your head, right? And um, in, in Nebraska, we still have tall grass prairie, but they don't necessarily get so tall unless they're obviously very happy with, with precipitation. So here is the um, different complexes of the, of the tall grass prairie and the largest intact tall grass prairie is in Kansas and it is the Flint Hills region. Unfortunately, um, in Nebraska, we have less than 1% of our tall grass prairie remaining. So some plant species of the tall grass prairie, I'm just gonna go through a few here tonight, so stick with me, um, is our big blue stem, which can get up to six to eight feet tall. And it's got a very characteristic inflorescence that people liken to a turkey foot. And actually that's one of the common names of it is turkey foot. And, but what's so amazing about grasses, if you can look up close to it, and that's why I put this up close picture of it, is you can see that it just has hairs. It has all these parts coming off of it. That's all really interesting. And my students love me because I teach them all those parts and they're so overwhelmed. 
but I have them, they have it down by the end of the semester. And then a very close relative of big blue stem is little blue stem, our state grass. And you can see here, it's kind of got a bluish hue to it. Um, the stems are kind of flattened. And, and then this is what it looks like in the fall. It turns this brilliant red. And that's what's so great about native grasses is they usually turn an amazing color in the fall and in the winter. And, and again, up close, you can see it's just got all these great hairs coming off of it that just make it so interesting. Um, another still kind of in the close relative is Indian grass. And this is the same picture I had on the start of this presentation. Um, it's kind of this yellowish um, inflorescence that you can kind of see here. And again, so many different kinds of hairs um, here, but, but another tall grass that can get up to five feet tall. So big blue stem and Indian grass are our tall grasses and little blue stem was kind of our mid grass that doesn't get as tall as these two. And then our switchgrass, we talked about biofuel, and it's got this kind of big inflorescence that you can see here in this picture. And this is kind of a, a not closely related to the last three that we just had. So it's a little different here. But here's the, the stigma, the part that collects the pollen sticking out of it. And this one can get up to five to six feet tall. And then our side oats, this is my favorite grass. And it's um, Cytoats groma, and its scientific name is Budalua curta pendula because it's got these pendulous um, spikelets that that come off of it, and it's just so um, it's so beautiful. I think it's just so beautiful, and it's easy to identify. So that's why I also love it as well when something's easy to identify. So this is another one, kind of our mid grasses that only get up to about three feet tall. So, so those were a few of our dominants in the tall grass prairie. And so, so now I'm going to show you the mixed grass prairie and show you how those dominants overlap in our mixed grass prairie as well. So now we kind of have grasses of medium height. Um, there's short grasses in there as well. And then the above ground material that you see is essentially half of what we had in the tall grass prairie. And so this is, this is our map of the mixed grass prairie and the differences. And you'll see that there is a blue and kind of a pink portion that comes into Nebraska. And again, this is all historical. We have lost 77% of our mixed grass prairie. But we do have a designation that, that came in the 1930s of our more northern mixed grass prairie and our southern mixed grass prairie. And really, it's just based upon where we're finding those cool season grasses and where we're finding those warm season grasses. So the cool season grasses up north so you're not going to get as much production as what you get down in the south with those warm season plants that are really taking off and growing in that midsummer hot, dry climate that you see. And so, so there's some overlaps. You already know some species of the mixed grass prairie now. You know switchgrass. You know side oats groma. You know Indian grass. You know big blue stem. And, and you know little blue stem. So you're already way ahead in the game of, of um, getting, uh, getting to know your grasses. And then we have, um, to add to that, one of my favorites is blue grama. And it's a short grass that only gets about 12 inches tall. And I always call it like it's a toothbrush grass. It looks like a toothbrush until it kind of starts drying out and then it turns into a loop. It kind of curls and looks kind of maybe more like your eyebrow, right? But it's one of our short grasses that likes to hang out likes to hang out a lot with buffalo grass that we see in our short grass prairie, which we'll get to. And then we have western wheatgrass as well. So a little bit different um, look to this plant. Again, kind of a bluish hue to this one um, as well, and not really a big showy inflorescence like we've seen in some of the others. And then onto our sand hills. So the sand hills, they're so amazing. They're so beautiful. If you haven't got out there, I encourage you to do it because it is just gorgeous. And it is the largest stabilized sand dune in the Western hemisphere. And it's stayed in grasslands because they can't really crop this area unless maybe they put a center pivot system into it um, because of kind of the fragile nature of, of the sandy areas. So it's, it's stabilized by those, by those grasses and, and some very important um, wildflower species as well. And so we see that here in Nebraska, we also have some sands sage and bluestem prairie and then there's just sand sagebrush in those particular ones but I'm going to specifically focus in on this the sand hills region and you already know some plants from it 
you already know your switchgrass, already know your Indian grass, and your little blue stem, and your blue grama are all going to be found here. So you're going to be grass experts on each of these prairies. And then there's some extra ones. And there's extra ones with a lot of sand in the common names. So you've got sand drop seed, and you've got sand blue stem, you've got prairie sand reed, sand love grass, because they all love to hang out in the grass, and they all love to that sand, and they all love to um, stabilize that sand as well. And then you've got needle and thread down here, which is just um, a, a nice um, grass as well with its long um, on. So essentially it just looks like a needle with a thread hanging off of it. And there is some differences in vegetation in the sand hills um, based upon whether you're in an upland region or you're a bottomland region. So that's important too. Those bottomlands are a little bit wetter. So you're gonna get a little bit different plant community out there. And we've made our way to the short grass prairie. Okay, so the most arid area of the state and where we're gonna find short grasses and bunch grasses and sod forming grasses, okay. And here, um, you can see the extension of the short grass prairie. And again, you already know plants in this area as well. You're gonna have your prairie sand reed, your side oats grama, your needle and thread, your blue grama, and then your Western wheatgrass. And you'll find some little blue stem and big blue stem even out here, but not in great abundance. So what I'm showing you tonight are some of the primary species you're gonna be able to find. So you're gonna, you're gonna start becoming those plant experts. But I do wanna add the last plant of the night, and this is buffalo grass. And it's, you know, it's a very short sod forming grass and it looks very similar to our side oats grama because it's closely related to it. So this is the male part. And then over here is the female part. And you can see the stigmas again that collect the pollen coming out of it, just a beautiful, beautiful plant, but it's hairy all over and it's short. And some people make a whole yard out of this particular plant because um, it doesn't take much mowing and it doesn't take much water. Okay, so we've talked a lot about um, different kinds of grasses and, and how they've evolved um, and where they have kind of come from and what do they look like across the state so you can start recognizing them. But what I really want you to know in a nutshell that they have evolved with really kind of three main themes going on and that's fire and grazing and climate. And um, they, they have this ability to adapt when they can escape drought and they can escape grazers and they can escape fire based upon their structure of, again, having that active growing point right there at the soil surface. Um, but, but what's interesting is when we start looking at um, this map, excuse me, this graph here when it comes to the precipitation and the temperature in our grasslands, we see that there's a wide variety of temperature and a wide variety of precipitation. And so then we need to characterize our grasslands a little bit differently because we need to know that they um, have periods of drought and dry weather. And so the ground dries out. And then we also have land that's kind of smooth and rolling um, because these um, precipitation and these temperatures can also support trees and brush. And so that's where we have a problem with woody encroachment. So really, when we think of the shaping of our grasslands and the health of our grasslands and the maintenance of our grasslands, it's not only grazers, it's also our fire and reoccurrence of fire. And so when we suppress that and maybe we don't graze like we should as well, then we have um, recolonization of, of woody species. And I've got a lovely, this, this um, video moves of the fire. You can hear it too, hopefully you can hear it. Um, if you can't, I, I should have added that on here. But um, prairie fire is really interesting in that it has a narrow flame width and, and it moves relatively rapidly. And because the soil is a good insulator, um, there very little heat ends up penetrating the soil just above um, below a few inches. And so again, those grasses can can adapt to that, have adapted to that. So what have we seen um, because of, uh, uh, of what has caused the declines in our grasslands? Um, obviously agriculture, urbanization, we've had the fire suppression leading to woody encroachment and also invasive 
species here. So to kind of finish up here, I want to talk about how, you know, grasses in general um, have possessed certain traits that they have acquired over evolutionary time, which have enabled them to be um, one of the most successful and most widespread groups in the world. And but then because of that, they also are, are the top weedy plant family as well and become problematic. And so we've seen several species um, um, be introduced for forage or for soil stabilization or, or accidentally, and then begin to start taking over um, our prairies. And so we have um, maps here showing smooth brome, cheatgrass, Kentucky bluegrass, tall fescue, and quackgrass as some of the problem ones. And you can see kind of where Nebraska sits into that or is coded um, in, in occurrences of that. So any of the light blue shading is where that and um, more of that invasive species is found. This one is pink over here because it is listed as a noxious weed. And so, um, so these are tough to sometimes get a hold of and get control of, but the, the one main theme of all these species you see here is their cool season grasses. So they start growing in spring. Sometimes we can knock them back by burning them um, or we can have timely herbicide application. Uh, which helps out. But I did want to point out two species that are very like our native grasses that you just learned, and they're warm season grasses. And they're starting to take over um, parts coming up from Kansas, taking over parts of Nebraska. And we even found, this map isn't even current, where that red star is, is where they found yellow blue stem up in South Dakota. And so what we thought of as our warm season grasses being not a problem and sticking to those southern states, we're now seeing more in Nebraska and moving northward as our, as our climate is warming. And so this is our Caucasian blue stem and our yellow blue stem. And these are very difficult to control and to get rid of. And then you also ultimately have to um, rehab the site or restore the site. But I also wanna talk you know, a little bit about woody encroachment and just show a couple pictures here that again, you know, we as settlers, they came and brought trees and they planted them and they grew and they thrived and they did windbreaks of eastern red cedar. And this is what you're seeing here now. So this is a hundred year difference of what now um, this area looks like of eastern red cedar. And you can see the encroachment here as well. So it's, um, it's a concern. And, and so putting fire back on the land or at least getting out there and taking out some of this woody vegetation is what's going to save our grasslands. And it can be done. This is a rehab site of where some um, Eastern red cedar encroached and they removed it. And now there's beautiful grassland back. You can still see the Eastern red cedar back behind it. So, so in spite of widespread loss and degradation of grasslands throughout North America and elsewhere across the world, um, the loss of such an important ecosystem certainly has not gone unnoticed. So then there's been several um, uh, things that have, have been done and are continuing to be done to, to prevent the loss by federal and state agencies. There's going to be a talk here in a couple weeks about the Conservation Reserve Program. You should listen to that one. That one is going to be great. Um, nonprofit organizations, like Nature Conservancy help out certain foundations, private landowners, and also prairie enthusiasts um, are really working to conserve preserve, protect, restore um, our grasslands. And one of the first um, people to um, do a grassland restoration was Aldo Leopold, um, who did about 24 hectares up in Wisconsin of tall grass prairie. And you can, you can see him here. And here's, here's the plot here. And then this is what the, what the prairie looks like back in 2020. So, um, so there's a big possibility to, to rehab and restore a lot of these areas. And I also want to leave you with a thought, too, of what can you do? Um, if you're in the Lincoln, Omaha area or nearby, you can always travel in and go see our Nine Mile Prairie and our Spring Creek Prairie. And you can teach your children or your students about the importance of, of prairie and grasses. And then they can begin to appreciate it, too. You can support a nonprofit. And also, I want you to be aware of that as we plant our gardens or we plant other areas with, with plants that we get, from stores or um, greenhouses, 
those have become invasive species as well. So we need to be mindful, mindful of that too. And so to kind of segue into Mitch's portion of it too, I just want you to understand the big history that the University of Nebraska comes with um, in regards to how significant of an impact we've had on grassland ecology and continue to have on grassland ecology. So um, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your time. And I'll pass the, pass the floor off here to, um, to Mitch. Okay, thank you, Cheryl. Um, and so I, I'm riding on Cheryl's coattails here. Uh, and, and she gave a just a, an excellent view of our grasslands and just how important they are. I'm I'm going to focus more on the Sandhills region. And so so with my position, we do a lot of research uh, within the Sandhills, and our goal is to look at how management is shaping some of these grasslands. Um, and so Cheryl highlighted a number of different management uh, practices and how they their effect on, on some of the grasses that are out there. And that's really what we're looking at. And so we have a project now where we're really monitoring Sandhills rangelands. And there's a couple of goals of this study is to, is to look at these plant assemblages. Uh, so some of these grasses that, that Cheryl talked about, along with forbs and shrubs, and see how they assemble themselves across the landscape. And the, the, the Sandhills is a fairly large landscape and a really, really good place to experiment with this because there's a lot of variability out there. So we are, we're interested in this variability and how these different species interact with one another. Okay. All right, I think it I think it's shifted. So so the Sandhills are a unique and important working landscape. Uh, they're about to about 25% of the state's land area. And Nebraska is somewhat unique in that it has about 46% of its land area that's classified as range or pasture land. Um, and then then about an equal proportion of that is is farmland that's already been converted. But the sand hills uh, here in the north central part of the state, about a little over 20,000 square miles. These are the uh, historic lands of the Pawnee and the Sioux uh, that, that use these as, as some of their ancestral hunting grounds. As Cheryl pointed out, this is the largest sand dune formation in the Western Hemisphere. Most of these sands come from the Laramie Mountains to the, to the west of us, uh, and, and they were deposited here. And, um, over time, there's been periods where they've been blowing sand, as you would see, like a sand dune in the Saharan Desert, where the move, sand moves with the wind, and then changes in climate have allowed it to become this vegetative uh, covered of the sand dunes. So they're, they're relatively stable uh, and in place. So it's it's an important refuge for native plant species. So there's over a hundred and there's 720 different plant species throughout this large area that have been found. And the, somewhat the unique thing about it is that, that a large majority of them are native to the area. And so, so that makes it really important and key habitat for plant and wildlife species. A number of those are these very important grasses that have established here. Um, it also has a very important wetland system for the Great Plains, and uh, and uh, with the, with the Ogallala Aquifer flowing underneath, this is one of the main recharge areas of this aquifer that stretches from uh, from from all the way from Nebraska down to Kansas. And lastly, this is an important social ecological system. And when I say that, it's, it's that the grasses and the plants that are native to the sand hills provide livelihoods and communities. And a lot of this is driven by, by beef production on these landscapes. And so, so these landscapes, in, in all the things they provide, they also provide some of these livelihoods and, and communities that are very important. Now this is a figure that shows uh, some of the changes that are happening and Cheryl talked about this a little bit but but conversion to crop production is one of the biggest threats to our grasslands in the Great Plains. And so this is a study that looked from 2008 to 2016 and tracked 
this conversion across the uh, the whole Great Plains and, and other regions. And so, so if it's in that dark uh, kind of orange brownish color, uh, that's an indication that it's it's converted to a cropland. And if it's in the blue uh, or the yellow, it indicates that there's low conversion uh, to cropland. And so if we look at the sand hills here, they're one of the, 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 the stark contrast to the Great Plains, especially as we move to the eastern side, uh, that, that they're not being converted to cropland. And a lot of this lies within the substrate. The sand substrate is just not great for growing a lot of our crops. And so that's protected it from a lot of conversion. Um, which, which is important for a number of ecosystem services, carbon sequestration, wildlife plant habitat, uh, hydrology we talked about, and then just aesthetics. It's a beautiful place and maintaining that's important. Uh, it's been it's been termed the last prairie uh, and and uh, for, for a number of reasons, but it's it's the most intact grassland uh, in the Great Plains. And so it has it has a it has as I talked about some of these livelihoods and communities it's valuable, uh, and so this is a this is a study that was done a few years ago that examined the the value of grazing in the Nebraska in Nebraska sandhills and the state as a whole. And so if you look at that purple area there, it shows the value, and that's that's uh, if you look at the V category, that's the value that they placed on that grass in a year. And so, so in those that purple region, it was about $254 million is what they placed that grazing value at. Uh, when we looked at the whole state, it was over $850 million. And so, so grazing has a tremendous value for our state's economy, and it's done on a number of these native lands that can be, be managed for both beef production, as well as some of the other uh, ecosystem services. And so there are a number of diverse management practices that producers need to think about as they as they manage these rangelands. And so there's a there's a chance that these these management can shift some of these grasslands uh, to more productive or less productive or for different goals and objectives. And so so this box figure here is what is used by the Natural Resource Conservation Service to kind of classify some of these plant communities and then have some of the arrows that drive maybe some of these changes. And so, so things like heavy grazing or fire or no fire uh, or uh, prescribed grazing or wildfire can all have an influence on, on these assemblages of plant communities. And so when, when, when livestock producers are managing their grazing, they have all these, these variables that they think about. And sometimes it's a long-term game. Uh, so the how we graze for the next de couple decades could have an influence, and then you tie on drought conditions, which also stress the plants, uh, or maybe other stressors, and, and you could see some of these grasses or plants shift maybe in an undesirable way. And so, so rangeland monitoring is an important aspect of understanding the plant community, but also seeing where your grasses are in terms of, uh, of, uh, uh, of, of where those, those grasses are viewed to be. And so when we think about rangeland monitoring, we think it's, uh, it's the orderly and repeated collection analysis and interpretation of natural resource information that can help to make shorter long-term decisions. And it's often called, uh, it, an often term is that we use is adaptive management which in short term is learning by doing is where we 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 put management on a range land uh, we evaluate the trade-offs and then we monitor to see how that's shifting the plant community and then make adjustments to manage it for certain goals and objectives and so for for a study that we we, we we've been planning is we wanted to see if we can learn by doing and so a big part of this was understanding that, that there are a number of producers out there that are excellent rangeland managers and they have a diversity of management practices and so so our goal was to go and work with producers to really monitor their rangelands and see what kind of variability is out there and understand maybe some of the variables that might be affecting the grasses and other plants that are there and so the the value of this is at a production scale it's it's realistic amongst management uh, conditions in the sand hills represents a broad range of conditions and management styles and then another benefit is we get the input from stakeholders and we learn about their history on the land and what they've learned from from managing cattle uh, oftentimes for 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 several decades uh, that they've they've had these places in their families 
And so this is how we monitor. And so if you're not familiar with monitoring, there's a number of different ways to look at a, look at a landscape. We have this, this monitoring frame is what we call it. And, uh, and, and so we're, what we really are looking at is presence or absence of plant species on a landscape. So, so we take this frame and we set it down a number of times and we, we say is, uh, for example, is, is, is little blue stem in this frame, yes or no? And so we write all the plants that are down and then we, we can get an average, or excuse me, we get a percentage of those frames that the plant was located in to help us kind of understand what that plant community looks like uh, quantitatively. And so as part of this study, we, we selected three or four pastures on each ranch, and then we divided it up to a number of sites. We, we, we focused on what's called the Sands Ecological Site, which is uh, the, the slopes and dunes uh, that are out there. So we avoided kind of swells because that can make a difference. And uh, then we avoided some of the really steep slopes as well. And so when we go out to a pasture, we would identify these spots and then we would we would we would set up in each of these little blue boxes or where we would set that frame down and we would read what plants were in that box. And so really trying to get a, a, a view of that landscape. And so we looked at, at ranches in this kind of lighter colored box here. And the sand hills are divided up into different precipitation zones. So as we go across Nebraska, we go from about 15 inches in the west uh, all the way up into the 30s in the east, inches of preci annual precipitation. And the sand hills in the western side, they're about 17 to 19 inches of precipitation. And in the central areas, they're about 19 to 22 inches of precipitation. And so we wanted to look across this, this, this kind of central area, western and central area of the sand hills and, and, uh, and collect data across what these grasses and plant species look like. And so across these sites, and we visited uh, nearly 100 different sites across this area, what we found is there was about 60 uh, forb species, uh, uh, 11 cool season grasses or grass likes, which are sedges, 11 warm season grasses and eight shrubs. So a total of 90 different species that are out there. And so while, while as Cheryl said, grasses are, are, are the driver of these systems, forbs, uh, which are some of these flowering species, are extremely important to the biodiversity of the landscape in the sand hills. Now, now this figure is kind of hard to follow, and but but bear with me here. Uh, so, so we have nine different ranches, and each of these polygons represents a, ra a ranch uh, quantitatively in their plant community. Um, and so, when you think about the how how far these polygons are apart, is an explanation of their variability. So, how closely did they align with one another in their plant community? And how closely were they, or how far apart were? And so uh, all the red, all the red is plant species, and they're all in their scientific names. And so, so forgive me there, but I'll go through it a little bit so you kind of understand. Um, so, so on the left side of this graph, we see four different polygons, and these are four different ranches that were in the western sand hills. So the 17, 19 inch precipitation zone. And then in the central side of the sand hills, we have on the right side are these five polygons, and so they were ranches. Uh, in the central side. So the first thing we did is we added all this data together in this analysis was we were able to pull these ranch or these plant communities apart based on where they were located in the sand hills. And uh, so, so some of the key plant species that we saw were different. Uh, the the Budalua gracilis here is uh, blue grama, which we learned about that one earlier. Uh, we didn't learn about this one. This is Scribner's rosette grass. This is little blue stem, which was a huge driver in separating out these 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 plant communities, and uh, and then this was a stiff sunflower here, uh, this helianthus, and so so what we're really interested in is this variability or how how different are the grass communities across the sand hills. And so this is an example. These are two different ranches. Uh, so so the the bars in the and the green are from a western ranch, and in the blue are a central ranch. And so as we look at this, we see that that the the central ranch had about eighty percent of those frames that we set down on that ranch had little blue stem, a little blue stem plant in them. Whereas in the western side, we really didn't see a whole lot of little blue stem. Uh, similar with with this stiff sunflower. 
Uh, we saw a lot of it in the central, but didn't see it as much in the west. Prairies, but but what we did see is more of a tall grass prairie sand reed and sand blue stem, which is a cousin of big blue stem uh, that we see in the sand hills. And then there's our friend blue grama, uh, which was much more prevalent in the west, as it's more of related to some of those drier communities uh, in the short grass uh, prairie. And so, so we're starting to picture that, that they're not as uniform, or it's not just a uniform sea of grass, it's, it's uh, quite variable and quite complex. And so this is a little bit more what it looks like here. Um, and I'll just click through these. Uh, so, so this is a Western Sand Hills Ranch, and, and it was really classified by the sand drop seed and the blue grama, uh, which, which you, can, you can kind of pick out throughout here. These, this, is, uh, this is sand blue stem, this kind of bluish looking grass. And then there is a little bit of little blue stem here in the background. Now, all these grasses were kind of in the middle. They, they, we saw them at both sites. Uh, They're fairly prevalent throughout. But this is a central sand hills ranch. And, and as you can see, much of this taller grass is little blue stem out here. Uh, we, we see some of these uh, stiff sunflowers poking through. And then this, this Scribner's rosette grass is this lower growing uh, grass uh, that's, that's kind of this green that fills in, the, in between the little blue stem plants. Now, we also saw some variability uh, at, at different ranches. I don't go into this too much, but, but even in the central Sandhills ranches, we did see that, that as they stretched apart in the top and the bottom, that there was some variability that was driven by species like stiff sunflower, but also this Scribner's rosette grass was much more prevalent on one, on one ranch than the other, as well as blue drama. So we're really trying to paint this picture here of what these plant communities look like so we can better understand when we go out to monitor uh, how, these, how these different plant assemblages fit. And so this is just an example of these two ranches. And so yeah, you, you can kind of see the stiff sunflower here in the mix. Uh, this is a shrub lead plant, and then, then a lot of these little blue stem plants kind of kept scattered throughout. And with all this data we're getting, uh, and is we're we're trying to we're starting to see some of these assemblages come out, some of these relationships and associations. So this is kind of a hard figure to follow, but but if it's a blue color and a blue box, these little these species are more associated with one another. If it's a one, that means it's this dark blue, and so as the darker blue means that they're always kind of seen together. Whereas if it has some of these darker browns, that means that they're less likely to be found in the same area. Um, so, so this is just one example of little blue stem. It has some positive associations with, with Scribner's rosette grass and switchgrass and stiff sunflower, but maybe a slightly more negative association with things like prairie sand reed, sand blue stem, and sand drop seed. Um, so, so, so as we can kind of paint a picture of what these 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 assemblages are and these this what how these grasses grow together, it helps us understand some of the dynamics of our rangelands and ways that we can manage them for certain objectives. And so, so this is in thinking about that adaptive management framework here, uh, where we identify goals and we evaluate the criteria make decisions on how we're going to implement grazing or fire or other management, we can then monitor and analyze this data so that we can make sure that we're providing the best habitat for some of these species to thrive. Now, now some of, just some of our preliminary analysis is, is we're, we're tracking this variability across the ranches. And, and the main thing we've seen is these regional differences in plant communities from west to central ranches. And it's likely that that's driven primarily by these differences in precipitation zones that are out there. Uh, we still have quite a bit of data to collect this next summer, and then we're going to start looking at some of the ways these ranches graze. So, so how, how, how many cattle they put on a landscape, how often do they move them, how long do they rest them, and, and other variables that can help explain maybe some of this, this uh, differences in the grasses and plants that we see. So our big goal of this project is to develop connections between the management strategies, the plant communities, and then also the soil health in the sand hills. And so, so we've started collecting uh, soil, um, 
soil data, looking at things like organic matter or nitrogen uh, or some of the microbial biomass that's in these areas. And this is a lot of, is, is primarily focused or uh, influenced by some of the root material that's down there. And as Cheryl pointed out, that about we only see about half of the total biomass of that plant. So we see what's on top there's a whole other world going on underneath the soil. And, uh, and, and these, this photo here uh, was from uh, Dr. Weaver, who, who, who spent much of his career in the, in the, the mid part of the 19, 1900s, um, collecting the soil uh, data information under this, these plants. And he has just tremendous images of the root systems of these plants. Now, if you're interested in this project, uh, feel free to, to search for what should my pastures look like UNL Beef Watch, and we have a number of different articles as well as, as data on what we're seeing out on these ranches. And with that, a number of people to thank as part of this project. Uh, this is my contact information. If, you, if you'd be interested in learning more about it, feel free to reach out as well. And so with that, I think, uh, I think both Cheryl and I would be more than happy to, 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 to answer some questions. I'll go ahead and stop sharing. Yeah, thank you very much, guys. That was really informative and uh, kind of enlightening about how much there is to learn about all of this, um, all of these native grasses out there and how much you know, work there is to do. Uh, so we have a couple questions here and we're going to um, wrap this up right around eight so we can uh, get on out of here in a timely manner. Uh, I think we might have covered this first one uh, here. Uh, Nancy asks, when were pine trees introduced to northwest Nebraska? We kind of looked at that uh, in one of those pictures. Yeah, the, we do have the, the ponderosa pine that's native to, to Nebraska in that northwest region and and we think of the Pine Ridge escarpment we think of the Wildcat Hills out in that region and that's all left over from when when Nebraska was forested like the temperature happened you know and shifted the forest pulled back and and so it's it was originally part you know apart it's a apart from the Black Hills and and so we still have some of those those pine trees there so we, we do have we do have that and I think uh was it that picture that you showed that said it was there was like it started out in 1912 and then it, from 2012 or from 1912 to 2012 how much development there was uh just of the trees in the area yeah that was, was that... eastern that was eastern red cedar encroachment mm -hmm. um martin is asking how could you plant grass i'm assuming in sort of a garden type setting in, in um maybe in the uh, you in your own uh, backyard is there um, a preferable way to do it like in patches or maybe as a as a your own mini type pasture or a uh, prairie you know there's there's various ways of doing it I mean there's there's plants available to buy and to purchase or you could put your own seed down there frankly the seeds of most other than the buffalo grass has to be treated with potassium nitrate usually they're they're very easy to germinate and to and to grow just wherever you put them like your switchgrass or your indian grass or your big blue stem if you make them very happy they are going to get big and so um so depending upon where you want to to do it um is great there's some good places around here stock seed provides seed um that has wildflower mixes in it and grass seed mixes in it that you could put down and do yourself or you can go out and you can collect your own grass seed um, that's pretty easy. And you'd want to do that around the August time. That's when that seed would be ripened about mid-August, late August um, into September, somewhere in there and go out and collect your own and plant it. Uh, Jan is asking, uh, why are nurseries allowed to sell some species that are, are very invasive to the, uh, um, or uh, maybe invasive to like non-native plants as well? So. Yeah, I mean, it's just nurseries. I mean, um, it, it, they can't sell noxious plants. They can't sell noxious weeds. And that's what's been, it's more of a, you know, it's passed through the legislature and everything else like that. But invasive plants, um, it doesn't matter. And like, you know, there's lantana that can be highly invasive in, in several um, systems, but um, they're great for pollinators. So you have to balance the push for pollinators versus 
you know, selling something that's introduced and potentially invasive into places, but um, fountain grass, pampas grass, those have escaped um, to along our roadsides and, and into our, into our grasslands. So, so things that big miscanthus grass and everything, that big pampas grass that you think is wonderful. Um, it, that, that seed flies and it goes to places that, that we don't want it to. So that's the problem. Birds are moving it. Animals are moving it. Wind is moving it. Uh, Martin, again, has the, uh, do the species of grasses ha uh, have different chemical compositions? Uh, maybe that's more of a Mitch, but, but I mean, when we think of, of grazing of our livestock, uh, grazing animals, you know, that, that composition um, changes. Uh, Mitch, I don't know if you want to answer yeah, that. Yeah, so, so when we think of it from a livestock uh, perspective, we're really looking at the, the, the nitrogen content in that, in that species, as, as well as some of their, their uh, fiber content uh, in, re in relation to cell solubles. Because that's, from a, from a cow's standpoint, if it has more cell solubles, that's, that's more digestible and they can use more of that nutrient. So, so we've actually started a study looking at the variability across a number of different grass species. And while they generally follow the same pattern as they get more mature, that, that, that crude protein and nitrogen content will go down in the plant. Uh, but, but there are some stark differences between certain species that are out there yeah um what are the main uh this is another martin question what are the main factors that, that affect the range of grass species is it participate is it mainly precipitation and the type of soil or is it something other than that yeah i would i would say you know definitely when it comes to the the shaping of the grasslands that we have here in nebraska it's been it's been precipitation, but the soils play a big factor as we saw in the sand hills that, that Mitch talked about. I mean, there's plants that, um, grasses in particular, that are, are devoted just to that particular region because they're adapted to that, um, that sandier soil content. Yeah, and so, so in, um, especially the sand hills, we see uh, that, that uh, some of the invasive species are often found in, in some of these lowland areas where they get a little bit more precipitation, like Kentucky bluegrass, for example, uh, it generally doesn't get it come out of that, that lowland area. So there, there are some areas that are a higher risk for invasion of some of these invasives. Yeah, yeah I mean, in the, and in the sand hills as well, you've got different plants on the north slope versus the south slope um, of some of those areas, so. That's very interesting. Uh, okay, I think this will be the last one and we'll just wrap up. Um, sorry if we didn't get to your question, but Sherry asks, uh, in a new grass uh, prairie slash wildflower garden project near Fremont, should I focus on tall grass or medium grass species based on the native locations of these different differing species? Okay, ask that, I'm sorry, can you say that one versus should she yeah, focus yeah. on, okay, on should tall grass? on tall grass or medium grass species based on the native locations of these uh, differing species? Well, as you can see in kind of my, my quick plant ID guide of grasses, um, there, there's a mixture of the mid and the tall it, throughout, even, even some of those tall grasses all the way out in, in the short grass prairie, even though they, they're, they're rare, you know, they're, they're more infrequent. Um, so, so you could really do a, a mix of of both and be fine, um, especially along those fringes of, you know, again, mixed in tall grass prairie, there's just, sometimes there's not a fine line between those. And, and again, you can have both. And, and frankly, your precipitation or soil and stuff like that is going to really determine height. If they're like, and I say happier in the way of like, they have everything that they need, then they can get to those tall heights of eight feet. Very, very cool. Um, so that's all, all the time we have for um, question and answer. It is eight o'clock now. So I just want to thank everybody for attending. Please uh, check out uh, Facebook for other events that Conservation Nebraska is hosting, including one on environmental equity next Friday, March 12th. And Cheryl, could you repeat what you said about the, another seminar about grass conservation efforts? I believe you have, I believe you have an upcoming sometime in, later in March on the Conservation Reserve oh. Program. Mm hmm Yes. So that's a, that's a good one to go to as well. And we also have one on uh, a film, online film viewing uh, on Green Fire. Uh, I think it's called Green Fire on, uh, on 
uh, fire restoration efforts and things of that nature. So um, one last thing before we go, survey questions will pop up as you leave the webinar and it would be wonderful and very helpful to us if you would participate in that survey. Shouldn't take more than a minute and it helps our numbers tremendously. So thank you for the last, uh, so for the last time, thank you Cheryl and Mitch for that wonderful information. And thank you all for attending and supporting Conservation Nebraska. Have a nice evening, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thanks.